You know, sometimes we read in the spirit of prophecy that uh, somebody gave a thousand dollars. And in your mind today, you're thinking thousand dollars, not a lot of money. But back in those days, a thousand dollars was huge. Just like when people used to say to be a millionaire. <laughs> what is that today? Okay, so for some of you, you may be thinking a lot of money, but you know, when you buy a house, and I don't know if you can buy a house, a decent house in Toronto for under a million. I don't know if that's a possibility or not anymore. You know, so you may have something like that and you don't realize you're a millionaire. I know uh, when I went to Australia, you know, I uh, went to Sydney and it's like, boy, the price, price of housing there was, uh, you know, for $300,000 what you can buy in Georgia. You know, that would be a mansion and over there in Australia, you can't even buy a small little hot house there. And um, after we moved there and sold our house, COVID came and I looked up online and that house that I was living in actually sold for 1.1 million. <laughs> okay, uh, that's not what we got for it definitely because that was, you know what happened with COVID with all the housing. So when we're talking about a millionaire, you know, sometimes we're thinking of it's a lot of money, but you know, even for those of you who are having a regular job, many of you earning $50,000 a year is not a lot. That means in 20 years you have earned what? How much would you earn in 20 years if you had $50,000 a year? How much? A million, that's right. Okay, so it's not as insurmountable as it used to be. However, the issue of uh, being a millionaire, what would you do if you had a millionaire? You know, yesterday we talked a little bit about the talent of what? What did we talk about yesterday? Time. Talent of time, that's right. And um, all of us are given how many talents? One. At least one. You know, you may have more than one talent. And uh, there is a talent that we don't talk about very often. You know, we, we kind of avoid talking about it and uh, you know, I know he mentioned that we're going to be talking about a different topic than money. But you know what? We're going to talk this morning about a topic we don't talk very often about, and that is money. Okay, so we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, I want you to think about this. It says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Notice this. What is it? God gives you the ability to gather wealth. Whether it's buying a home, fixing it up, and then having a decent house. Whether it is uh, getting a very high qualified job in which you're making money. God is the one that gives you power to obtain wealth. Why? It says that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. So, when we're talking here about money, you know, it says here in volume 2, the earth is the Lord's and all the treasures it contains. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion sometimes about donations. Somebody gives you a donation. <coughs> and the question that we often ask is, do we accept money from just anybody? Well, you need to understand one principle. Whose money is it? It's God's money. It doesn't matter where it is. It's God's money. It does not belong. The person who gives it, it's not their money. Whose money is it? Because what? The earth is the Lord and what? All the treasures it contains all the treasures the cattle upon a thousand hills are his all the gold and silver belong to him he has entrusted his treasures to stewards that with them they may advance his cause and glorify his name what is a steward what is a steward no, he's like a manager. So a lot of times you have a wealthy home and you go to that home and someone manages all that estate. That is called a steward. 
Whose money is it? Does it belong to the steward? Does he act like it belongs to him? Sure, but he knows what? It doesn't belong to me. And that steward can walk away from that premises with what? With nothing. Why? He knows it's not his money. And so you and I are stewards of God to do what? What's the purpose? Why does he give you abilities? So you all are kids here sitting here on the front row. Nice to see you all here. And you all thinking to yourself right now, well, I don't got any money. But you got abilities. And God will help you one day to start earning something for what purpose? You know, if I were a millionaire, well, what's the purpose of being a millionaire? You know, what, why do you have that? <coughs> Notice here that with them they may advance his cause and glorify his name. So whether you're talking about your abilities, whether you're talking about your finances, they're not yours. God has put them in your hands to see how you can advance his cause. And uh, we're talking not only about means, but we're also talking about your abilities. This is why we need more and more people to be serious about this whole thing about evangelism. You know, we often talk about, oh, I can do it in other ways. Yes, but we need people. You know, I was just talking to someone this morning, and you know, we have a lot of visitors come to our churches on a regular basis. Our problem is not attracting visitors. What's our problem? What's our problem? It's the follow-up to translate those visitors into members. And how do you do that follow-up? You need people. You need people who have, been, who have forsaken the interests of the world completely and have dedicated their full time to the ministry. That's what we need. That's what we're lacking. And sometimes we're, we're getting our minds skewed in the wrong direction. We're thinking of being successful in this earth. But if we understand that we're only stewards both of our time and of our money, then it would not be a hard thing for us to sit there and say, okay, let's give up all this. And you know, many times I find that, uh, you know, sometimes by going into the Word, God will bless you beyond what you can imagine. I remember one time, you know, when I was living in Maryland, we had bought a house. We had a nice car. And one of our church members decided that they wanted to be a worker. And they applied to be a Bible worker. <laughs> when I knew that, I was the local church treasurer at the time, and so I was kind of laughing because I knew that person was making three times my wage. And they decided to give that person a higher wage than I would normally have. And it was not even half of what they were already making. And they said, oh, I can't live on that. How was I able to do this? Well, God blessed us. Regardless of, of what it appeared, you may have less money, but God gives you other abilities. And we still ended up having a home. You know, I remember... When I, was, uh, when I left missionary school, you know, there were some young people that were also invited to go into missionary work. And uh, their family was like, oh, no, 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 we don't want you to be poor the rest of your life. You know, and as time went on, the poor guy went through th three bankruptcies and ended up living in a rented trailer at the end. Why? Because you understand something, God also blesses. He can make your, He can give you opportunities in buying a house, for example, that you could not. When we moved to Australia, it was impossible to buy a house. You know, we went over there. Uh, when my wife moved over there with me, she says, what have you done? <laughs> you come, we can't afford even the rent a place. And as we were looking, you know, God did something wonderful. He provided us with something called the global financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, God gave it to us, you know, brought in a global financial crisis just there. The property market tumbled. I bought a house 
and within three months the property market went back up. I could never afford it. It was a three month little thing, window there. Why? Because God will take care of you. Okay, so if you're looking at finances, if you really understand that God is the owner of all these treasuries, then nothing will be a problem. You know, so what we have to look at, that what God does, He requires and accepts our gold and silver as an evidence that all we have and are belongs to Him. So when you're giving to God, what it happens? He is you giving that, he is accepting that as evidence that you recognize that everything belongs to God. So we have to understand something. We have a talent of means. Some people have money and some people are really able to make money. Some people are able to, that whatever they touch turns into money, okay? They have that talent, okay? We need to remember all we possess is the Lord's and we are accountable to Him for the use we make of it. In the use of every penny, it will be seen whether we love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. How do you use the means that you have? What are you doing with it? Are you showing that you love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself? So let's talk a little bit about this talent of means this morning. We need to address the root cause of evil. Okay, we got to start with that. We need to understand, and, and a lot of people misunderstand something. They misquote a Bible verse. And I've heard this verse misquoted so many times, it's pitiful. You know, and they quote it and says, for money is the root of all evil. If money is the root of evil, all evil, get rid of it. When you go to work, tell the employer, I don't want your money, I just want to work. <laughs> okay? Why are you taking money? The problem here, it says it's the love of money. And many times we have a misconception. We think wealthy people love money. And I have found over the years, poor people love money even more. They just don't have it. They love it. Okay, they're doing everything they can to grab a hold of it. You know that these lotteries? Who plays the lottery? You don't get wealthy people playing the lottery. Who is playing the lottery? Poor people. With what? With money they don't have. They have, they have not enough money to eat and they go play the lottery. You know, somebody just won the billion dollar lottery the other day. Where did the billion dollars come from? <laughs> Poor people. Why? They love money. <laughs> because they love it. And you know, on average, on average, majority of people that win the lottery within 10 years are poorer than before they won the lottery. That's on average. They blow it just that quickly. There's a few people that don't. I understand that. But the majority, they're back in the same spot. Why? Because they love money. And so, it's not just the wealthy. The problem here is the love of money. It is the love of money that the Word of God denounces as the root of all evil. Money itself is a gift of God to man. Did you know that? Did you ever consider money is God's gift to us? That's what it is. But what? It, 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 to be used with fidelity in what? In His service. You know, I know, I knew one brother, he had, um, he had money. He had a good deal of means, and what did he do? You know, there's a lot of work, from the general conference perspective, I know personally, a lot of countries we never would have had developed if it wasn't for that person giving money, and telling other wealthy people to give money in that. You know, Congo, the brother there is from Congo, where is he? Oh, he might have stepped out or something. Oh, there you are. Okay, he's there from Congo. 
Uh, you know, in Congo, we had that little group there in southern Congo for years. We're talking about probably, you know, decades was that little group, about 100, 120 members down there in southern Congo. Okay? And this one brother, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford to pay workers over there. So he hired a whole bunch of workers there in Congo. And today, the membership of Congo is, if it's not the second, it's the third largest membership in our church in the entire world. Huh? I'm not sure. Peru is up there. Peru is really up there, so I'm not sure because you have, it's not just the Congolese Union because you have the two Kivus up there too, which is, I'm looking at that. But the Peru could be passing it up as well because every time I check the numbers, it's either Peru or Congo, you know, so one of those two are up there. But the fact is that that never would have happened if one person didn't decide that they want to invest in a place that we just didn't have money to invest in, and that's not the only place. Okay? So what we find here is to have money, money is not evil, when you understand it is God's gift to us to be used for His glory. When we talk about money, the love of money I'm talking about, we have to understand an important word. It said unto them, take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Life is not how much you own. You know, my uncle, he bought, built himself a really beautiful house. You know, he, his wife saw the movie Gone with the Wind and they replicated the stairway in their house. Okay. <laughs> beautiful home, absolutely lovely. His Garage. He built an, in a huge, the, the whole big part of the house downstairs is a big garage. He loved antique cars. It's full of antique cars. He died with all those cars sitting there. <laughs> what good is it? What good is that? All those cars sitting there nicely. You see, it does not consist in the abundance of the things which you possess. You know, I remember I was at a funeral of a sister there in, um, in Australia, in our church there in Sydney area, and uh, she passed away. And um, just before she passed, she had to go to a nursing home. And the, um, her uh, nephew, had to help her move stuff. And you know, from her house to the nursing home, you just, <laughs> there's not much room there. And I'll never forget uh, talking about at the funeral, he says, he was talking about stuff. It all became what? It just became stuff. Boxes and boxes of stuff that you cannot take anymore with you. That's it. So what's the purpose of all the stuff that you bought. Whether it's all the extra cars, whether it's the extra homes, whether it's anything, what's the purpose of the stuff? Life does not consist. Who you are does not consist in stuff. Okay? That's why it says beware of covetousness because covetousness is desiring what? Desiring stuff. Desiring somebody else's stuff. I want that stuff. And you get that stuff and what do you have? You want more stuff. Okay, and then you have all the stuff. And then you die with all your stuff. <laughs> Look at all the, the Egyptian kings. They go down there and they have full of their, their big pyramid and it's full of what? Of stuff. <laughs> and they're dead. They're gone. Because that's all their stuff was there. You know, there's a parable Jesus gave about stuff. Spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? 
So what does he do? He goes down and he says, this I will do. I will pull down my barns. Took all the barns down. Built greater barns, bigger barns. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he builds all these huge, big new barns. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Problem was, that night, he died. With what? With all the stuff. I know how many people saved all their stuff for, for, uh, for the future. Because the economy is collapsing. So they bought all this grain. They bought all this food. They stuck it all there. And one day they came to go look at it. And a mouse had eaten it all. Yeah, somehow a mouse got in there and ate the whole thing. Okay? What happened to all their valuable stuff? You know, in Y2K. <coughs> Y2K. There was big business in selling generators and food. And do you know who was among the leading people that bought all that food and generators? Adventists. Adventists bought all that stuff. You know, I was there at our JC headquarters one day. I was visiting there and uh, we had somebody coming there to warn us about Y2K. You all need to start providing provisions for the future. Brother Sass was the president at the time and he says, you know, the guy asked him, he says, what are you going to do when suddenly you know, have no electricity? And Brother Sass said, I'll finally go to bed at, on time. <laughs> Didn't worry about it. You know why? Because stuff is not what we're looking for. You know, to provide for the future. Whose is it going to be when it's all gone? Riches caused the professed followers of Christ many perplexities and pierced them through with many sorrows. Because why? They forget God and love and worship man. And that's the problem. That's the problem that we face. So when we're looking for this, we need to understand that when God makes you a steward, who is the steward? If God says, you are now going to be a steward, who is the steward? Who? You. Not your brother? Not your brother? Not your steward? Not your sister? Not your parents? Not your future Creek kids? You are the steward. We need to understand, we become the steward. We are the steward of this. Now, one of the problems, we'll come back to this in a moment. But you know one of the two biggest problems that we face as a church? And we don't, you know, we don't emphasize them equally. You know, it says here, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. What are the two things? Cares of the world and... The deceitfulness of riches. You know, how many times, and, and, and it's important to address worldliness, okay? Whether we're dealing with dress reform or other aspects of worldliness, it's important to do that. Because that is our problem. But how many times do we talk about the deceitfulness of riches? Which are the two big issues. Some people I know, they dress all perfectly fine, but they're hanging on to their money. Guess what? You're going to the same place as they are. Unless you repent, you're going to the same place. Why? Because you're hanging on to these two things. That which is eating out the vitals of God's people is the love of money and the friendship of the world. How much we could accomplish if we use the means that God has given to us 
in evangelism. How much we would accomplish if we would actually dedicate our abilities not to making money but to evangelism itself. How many more Bible workers we would have? How many more ministers we would have? If we would just understand this principle. Those who think to ease their conscience. By what? By willing their property to their children. Or by withholding from God's cause. And suffering it to pass into the hands of unbelieving reckless children. For them to squander or hoard up and worship will have to render an account to God they are unfaithful stewards of their Lord's money. They take their money that God has blessed them with and what do they do? They give it to whom? Even believing children we're going to see here is a problem sometimes. Oh, don't worry, I have given everything in my will when I die. In other words, let me hang on to it till the last breath. And then I'll give it to God. You're not giving it to God, by the way. When majority of your assets are given as a will after you die, it means that you hung on to it till your last breath. And I'm sorry, you're going to a wrong place. Parents should have great fear in entrusting children with the talent of means that God has placed in their hands. Parents should what? Have fear. Because who's the steward? You are the steward. Leaving it to your kids and grandkids. You're entrusting to them stewardship. Unless they have the surest evidence that their children have greater interest in, love for, and devotion to the cause of God that they themselves possess. Unless you're absolutely sure that your kids have a more devoted interest to the cause of God than you. And that these children will be more earnest and zealous in forwarding the work of God and more benevolent in carrying forward the various enterprises connected with it which call for means. But many place their means in the hands of their children thus throwing upon them the responsibility of their own stewardship. Why? Why do parents give to their children the responsibility of their stewardship? Why? Who gives them that idea? Because Satan prompts them to do it. Who does? Satan prompts them to do it. Oh, you get your children to take care of it. You get, they'll, they'll, be, they'll manage it. And you know something, in, in so doing, they effectually place their means in the enemy's ranks. You might as well just hand it over to Satan and say, Here, Satan, take care of this while I'm gone. Same thing. And this, is, this gets even worse now. A lot of, and I've seen this happen over and over again. I've seen this happen in, our, in, in, in lives of brethren who have lots of means. If they have true believing children and also children whose affections are holy upon the things of the world, in making a transfer of their means to their children, they generally give a larger amount to those children who do not love God and who are serving the enemy of all righteousness than to those who are serving God. They have children and they have unbelieving children. The children that are believers, they give them less than the unbelievers. What sense does that make? Do you think those, oh, they think, oh, you know, by giving them, the children will remember me and they're going to accept the truth. Do you think that's going to happen? 
They place in the hands of unfaithful children the very things that will prove a snare to them. In other words, what they do, they're unbelieving children and they give them these vast amount of means and guess what? That is the children's problem. And you think now they're going to accept God? And that will be obstacles in the way of their making the surrender to God. So if they could have had a surrender, they're going to end up with having another obstacle placed in regards to surrender to God. This is why it's so important to speak to people as they're getting older, to understand their responsibility in stewardship, in their stewardship, what to do with their means. And we're often afraid to talk to people about their means. We're afraid to talk to people about them dying. I'll never forget, I uh, went to a brother one time and um, he had cancer. I hadn't seen him in a while. He had left the church actually. He had left the church for different reasons. And anyway, I went to go visit him. I happened to be in the area at the time. And uh, I looked at him and he looked like he was death warmed up. And he's telling me how God's going to do a wonderful miracle. He's going to be saved. He's gonna, God's going to bring him to health. And it's going to be a, uh, a showing the world what miracles God can do. And I said, yeah, that could happen. But I have a question for you. Are you ready to die? <laughs> what do you mean? Am I ready? I'm not, I'm not going to die, he said. God's going to do a miracle. I said, yeah, but are you ready to die? Are you ready that this is the end? That this could be the end? I could maybe never see you again. You know, and uh, wow. You know, at that point, he, we had a prayer. He gave his heart to the Lord again. And I was fearful for his future. I know he was outside the church and everything else. And I asked him, he says, you know, have you settled everything with the... Because I knew he, he, he gave one reason why he left the church, but there was another reason. I knew of the other reason a little bit. And I asked him, have you settled those issues with those people? And he said, yes, I have. He says, I've talked to all of them. I, everything is settled. And I said, well then, are you ready? Uh, do you think you should get baptized? And he says, yes, I should get baptized. And so I was leaving that day, but another brother was uh, visiting there. Another minister was coming there. So I arranged for a baptism on Wednesday. And um, I left. I went back to my home and um, he was baptized. They had to baptize him in a, uh, in a pool. They had to get a pool in the living room there and fill it up with water and do a baptism there. He could not move. And on Friday he was gone. You know, that was it. That, the life was over, you know. We have to be prepared to talk about things. He didn't have money, so it wasn't an issue to talking about means, but we we're talking about his soul. You know, we have to be prepared to talk to people both about their future and, and also their, their means, what they're going to do with them. You know, many manifest a needless delicacy on this point. They feel that they are stepping upon forbidden ground when they introduce the subject of property to the aged or to invalids in order to learn what disposition they designed to make of it. We have an obligation to talk to people about what are you going to do with your means. But this duty is just as sacred as the duty to preach the word to say so. Did you know talking about means, talking about a person's asset, is just as much a duty as preaching the gospel. And if we don't do that, we're derelict in our duty in speaking about the assets that people have. Because whose assets are they? Whose assets are they? They're God's. They're not ours. They belong to God. And we have an important responsibility. So what happens if somebody dies without such arrangements? This would be a fearful loss to himself and to the cause. For by placing his talent of means in the hands of those who have no regard for the truth of God, he would to all intents and purposes be wrapping it in a napkin and hiding it in the earth. And you remember the parable, what happened when the guy, the guy that wrapped it in a napkin and hid it? What happened to the guy? What is he called? 
unfaithful servant. There's another term that was read in Luke. What was that other term? Wicked servant. And what does it mean, wicked? It means you're lost. A person who does not take care of this actually is lost. They are not saved. And that's why it's important to talk about some of these things. So what should we do? Especially when we realize that we are mortals. Some wills are made in so loose a manner that they will not stand the test of the law. And thus thousands of dollars have been lost to the cause. You know, when you look at some of the wills, you know, sometimes people die and they look at the will and it's hopeless. And where does it go? If they have unbelieving children, guess what? And they're ready to fight for it all. And if they don't have any children, guess what? The government gets it. You've been spending all your life trying to avoid taxes and you give the whole lot when you die. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Okay, none of this here makes sense. You see, so it's important to make wills that are consistent in a legal manner. But you know there's something better to do than a will. You know what, what is better to do than having just a will? A, a will is necessary, but you know what's something better? You know, it says here, the Lord would have his followers dispense their means while they can do it themselves. You know, it's amazing what happens when somebody dies. You know, suddenly all the long lost relatives show up. You know, uh, and especially, you know, the, one of the worst is the wealthy ones. They, they're prepared to fight it tooth and nail. They're ready to take it to court to deal with the will and everything else. And you know, my grandfather, he moved to the United States just before he was 65 years old. He was like 62, 63, something like that. And um, when he moved to the United States, um, within a short time, he ended up retiring, okay? So he didn't have a lot of means there. But my grandmother, she was involved in a car accident, and um, he quickly used the money and bought a house, okay? And he was a very um, uh, shrewd guy with his money, okay? When you enter into his house, he had only 30 watt light bulbs, by the way. Okay, and they can only be on in the room he is in. So if you're in the other room, you want light, you got to come to his room, okay, where he has it on, okay, that's it, okay. He was really, you know, shrewd with his money, okay. Uh, even the telephone line, he had a party line because it was cheaper, okay. So, um, you know, but somehow or another, you know, this guy, when he retired, he bought himself another house. You know, saved up enough money like that, bought another house. There was... And by the, time, uh, as, by the time he was like 80-something years old, he had seven houses. Or I should say seven properties. Because I remember on one property, he had a house at the front he was renting. On the back was a building. And there was a full apartment upstairs, like a three, four bedroom apartment. Downstairs was another one bedroom apartment. And then there was a shed that he converted into an apartment. So the guy was renting all this stuff and everything else, you know. And one day he died. And when he died, all the relatives showed up for the big battle. And especially the wealthy ones came there for the big battle. And when they came there for the big prolonged legal battle that they were expecting, he had no assets. What they didn't realize. As he was getting older, he began selling houses one by one. And he put into the cause of God what he believed. He says, okay, sold a house, put it over there. Sold another house, put it over there. And he was living in the house. And it was in the church's name. <laughs> it wasn't even in his own name. He gave it and put it in the church's name. And guess what? No family fight. <laughs> I only heard about it because I wasn't there. I was living in Maryland at the time. But there was no family fight. Why? Because he dispensed his means while he was alive. 
And he can see where it went, how it went, and made sure that it went there. And uh, he did have some money left over, and that was easily distributed. It wasn't such a, I mean, it was a large money to, to some people, but it wasn't huge like own a house or something like that. All of that was dispensed while he was alive. And you know, that, that stayed in my memory. You know, that this is what he did, and this is what it says here in the Spirit of Prophecy. To do it, especially when you're alive, because guess what? No one can contest the will. You know, uh, my wife was taking care of a man one time. He was 90-something years old, and he, um, he, had, um, uh, he had amassed quite a bit of money in his day. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, he had sold all his houses and everything else that he had. Uh, but back in those days, he had three quarters of a million dollars that he had, um, that he had uh, managed to save. And he had it for different projects and whatnot. And you know, we were reading actually the testimonies. <laughs> and whenever we came to these quotes, he's like, well, what is this? And the guy was constantly at the bank dealing with his money, okay? He always looking at his money and everything else, you know. By the time he died, he didn't have it in a will, he had it in a trust. So it didn't even belong, it was like it didn't belong to him. The bank was in charge of a trust, and um, I think he gave $5,000 to each of his kids. And his kids were well off, okay, they didn't need the money, this was just a token. And he put there in the trust that if anybody complains, they get $1. Okay? <laughs> so he, he did it really well. The rest of it went to the church. And you know, we have the church in Nashville. A good deal of the uh, money that came for that was for that church. There's a church in Washington State that they paid off. Sacramento Church, they did an extension. Some of that was paid off. And a lot of churches in Romania got built. Uh, back in those days, $5,000 could build a church. And he, uh, he, all the money was used in, in those areas. Lots of churches were built as a result because he put it into trust. He needed some funds to live on, by the way. He had given away a lot of his money before that, but he needed something. He was living on the interest is basically what he was living on this amount of money, but it was placed in a trust account so that it cannot be uh, fought over. And this is what we need to be doing if we are truly understanding our stewardship. Such excuse their covetousness by informing you that they have made arrangements to be charitable at death. They have considered a cause of God in their wills, therefore they live a life of avarice, robbing God in tithes and in offerings. And in their wills return to God but a small portion of that which he had lent them, while a very large proportion is appropriated to relatives who have no interest in the truth. This is the worst kind of robbery. They rob God of his just dues, not only through life, but also at death. Through that entire time, what are they doing? They are simply robbing God. It is utter folly to defer to make a preparation for the future until nearly the last hour of the present life. It's absolutely foolishness. To sit there and spend everything uh, until you're just about to die. This is why the Lord requires that those to whom he has lent talent of means make a right use of them. Having the advancement of his cause prominent, every other consideration should be inferior to this. Considering that if our heart is in heaven, if our treasure is is in heaven, then every other consideration will be subordinate to that. Everything will be in connection to what will glorify God. You know, flattering, another issue here, I, I've seen this, especially among those who are poorer. And I've seen money devastated by this. It says, a flattering prospect may be presented to invest in patent rights or some other supposedly brilliant enterprise around which Satan throws a bewitching enchantment. 
The proposal of getting more money fast and easily allures them. They reasoned that although they had resolved to put this money into the treasury of God, they will use it in, his, in this instance and will greatly increase it and will then give a larger sum to the cause. They can see no possibility of failure. Away goes the means out of their hands and they soon learn to their regret that they have made a mistake. They lost all they had invested and robbed God of that which they should have rendered to Him. You know, I've seen people, oh, this is a guarantee. You invested a thousand dollars and in a month you will earn a thousand dollars. I've seen that and some, one time I remember when you're buying a church property, one of the committee members said, look, there's this guarantee. You know, if we invest $100,000, we will have a million back in a month. And at the end of that, we're going to have more money than you can imagine. Now, if it's so sure, how come you're so poor? How come you're barely struggling yourself? How come you're, how come, and, and then, and they got, actually they got other people in the church. They, we had members who borrowed money on their credit card. Because it's a guaranteed investment. Sometime later I was at the GC office and a non-member complained. Because they had invested a hundred thousand dollars of borrowed money. And all of it is what happened. Completely gone. Why? If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. It's a fact. Okay, if it's absolutely like that, you know already it's a scam. And why is it that so many people fall for these scams? Why do you get emails for all these scams coming up constantly? Why? Do you know why? You know why you get them all the time? Huh? Because somebody is falling for it. <laughs> somebody is still falling for it. I was just reading a thing. Um, I still have an account there in Australia. And I was reading something from there. How many millions of dollars every year are squandered away by seniors because scams are coming to them and the banks are warning of these scams constantly they're getting warning after warning of these scams and people are still falling for it because they think they can make it poor people that means when so much money was lost and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars just in that one incident that I knew about of church members you know and then they, they have to sell their home now to, to uh, move to another area where they don't want to really be in because that's all they can afford good thing they still had some money left to buy a house why because it's the love of money and what about religious privileges not even to mention this you know in our Sabbath school lesson we just had this in our review yesterday not forsaking what? The assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Oh, what does that mean? What relationship does this have to what we're talking about? It's quite simple. Some fearing they will suffer loss of earthly treasures, neglect prayer, and the assembling of themselves together for the worship of God that they may have more time to devote to their farms or their business. Oh, what's, what's happening there? We're spending more time in our businesses and oh, we got to work, we got to work. And what gets neglected? Our church attendance. We neglect the assembling of ourselves together. And, uh, and especially when you're coming from when you're coming from um, some poor countries, I see people come to these countries and they work like slaves. They work day and night. They have no time for, they don't even have time for their family. 
How many divorces happened over the years? What, they don't have time for each other? They're busy what? Making money. I just met a man recently. He just started visiting our church there in Roanoke. And uh, he just got a divorce. And um, he came to this country and he worked like a slave. He amassed wealth. Had no time for his family. Absolutely no time for his family. And one day she decided to divorce him. And she had a good attorney and cleaned him out. Has nothing left. And now he's starting all over again. What's the worth of it all? What, what value was there in all of that? You know, you lost your family, you lost your religion. At least now, you know, he has nothing. Now he starts turning back to God again. Well, you know, that, 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 that we have to wait for that? They sacrifice religious privilege, privileges which are essential to their spiritual advancement for the things of this life and fail to obtain a knowledge of the divine will. Men of property are dying spiritually because of the neglect to use the means God has placed in their hands to aid in the saving of their fellow men. God has given us these things for a reason. You know, we need to keep in mind that the purpose that God gives us anything is for what? To spread the gospel throughout the world. All these bounties and blessings come from Him to prove, to test, and develop the character of man. That's why we have all these things. And I want to just spend a few moments here on laying up our treasure in heaven. Let's, let's talk about that. You know, Matthew 16 says, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon the earth. This was our key text this morning, right? Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, whether neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and whether, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The question here is actually, what do you treasure? Now this is the question. What do you treasure? Do you treasure money? Do you treasure things? Do you treasure souls? These are the questions that you need to understand. So when it says here in 1 Timothy, notice here in these verses, really important, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So by the way, God has given us things to enjoy too. It does not mean that you do not enjoy life. Okay, I've met some people. They are sitting on very high assets and they enjoy nothing. No conveniences, nothing. They're living like almost... I've met one guy who lived almost like a hobo. Okay, and he's sitting on millions of dollars, you know, and absolutely just won't do anything. Uh, to, he won't even improve his own life. Okay, so God has given us means, it says here, to what? Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Notice here. Doing good. You know, you want to enjoy life, do something good for somebody. If you're down, if you're despondent, if you're depressed, one absolute sure way to get out of depression is to go help somebody. You know, I, I went to visit somebody a few times in, a, uh, in those facilities, uh, psychiatric facilities. And I sit down, I was waiting for the patient that I, needed, I came to see. And everybody wants to talk to me. And you know what their conversation is? It will never, it, it never, it, it's always the same. Me, myself, and I, that's it. That's all they ever talk about. Constantly. Every single one of them. So you want to solve that situation? Go help somebody else. Ready to distribute. Eager to give, it says here. And notice here, if we are, they that do good, they're 
that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's how you lay hold of eternal life. That's how you end up with a firm foundation that you build upon. Many have their hearts so fixed upon their earthly treasure that they do not discern the advantage of laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. They do not realize that their free will offerings to God are not enriching Him but themselves. You know, giving to God is not enriching God. It already belongs to Him. He can make more. He can make more gold if He wants to. He can make another diamond if He wants to. Just says, let there be a diamond. That's it. It's there. Real. Just as anything. God does not need our money to enrich Himself. It actually benefits us. If we can only have our eyes open, we will see that God wants to benefit. Give us the enrichment of it all. The remedy he proposes for the wealthy is a transfer of their affections from earthly riches to the eternal inheritance. That's what God has. Just transfer your funds over. Transfer it to him. By investing their means in the cause of God to aid in the salvation of souls and by blessing the needy with their means, they become rich in good works and are laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This will prove a safe investment. You want a guaranteed investment? That's what it is. Invest in eternal life. You know you can start investing in eternal life already. Did you know that? Yeah, you, all you have to do is start helping other people. Yeah, by helping somebody, you start investing in eternal life. Did you know that? So that means at home, when, you're, uh, when you see that the dishes need to be washed, you don't have to be asked, can you wash the dishes? What do you do? Yeah, you wash them. You go there and say, can I help you wash? That's already doing what? That, you got the right word. She got the word, investing. You got the word, sister. She had the word, investing. You start investing. That's what it's all about. But many show by their works that they dare not trust in the bank of heaven. Do you trust in the bank of heaven? What do you think? Do you think the bank of heaven is going to go bankrupt? No. Do so you think you can trust in that bank? Yeah, that's what you need to invest in, you see. What happens if we don't have that much? You're sitting there looking at me like, I don't have anything. You know, here's what it says. And Jesus sat, you know the story, over against the treasury, and behold, how people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. Do you remember the story about the poor widow? What, what did she do? Wow, that, did you hear that? I know you didn't hear it all, but you know, she said she had her last two coins that she needed to survive on. She got that. It wasn't just some extra coin. It was that she needed to survive. And she gave that. Okay. Why are poor countries still poor? You ever think about that? What do you consider wealthy countries? Hmm? Protestant countries. Protestant countries, yes, but what makes them wealthy? What makes them wealthy? They're generous. You take a look, when it's, uh, you know, you hear, and, and, and you, you include you know, Canada, the United States, Australia, Western European countries. When there's a crisis around the world, what happens? They get money. The other countries learn only one thing. What is it? When is these countries going to help us? And you know, over the years I've seen churches. Local churches. There are some churches that always give. You need, there's an invitation, we need help. And suddenly they gather 
10, 20, 30 thousand dollars sometimes, not even a thought. They gather that much in one offering sometimes <coughs> for special needs. And these are considered what? Well-to-do churches. And, and they're not always, if you look at them, they were no different than some other places. And other places, they only have one thing. Who can help us? And they always end up poor. The moment a person begins to give, that moment, God can trust them with more. You want to you wanna just try it out. You know, Christ esteemed her gift more valuable than the large offerings of the most wealthy. They gave of their abundance. They would not feel the least privation because of their offering. They don't even miss it. But the widow had deprived herself of even the necessities of life to make her little offering. She could not see how her future wants were to be supplied. She had no husband to support her in want. She trusted God for the morrow. The value of the gift is not estimated so much by the amount that is given as by the proportion and by the motive which prompts the gift. What is your motive? Are you giving only in excess or are you giving of something that you needed? Keep in mind, God's not going to ask, God does not want your gift unless it is what? What do you think is the key word there? Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth what? Cheerful. Cheerful giver. Cheerfully giving. Cheerfully, uh, even not just money, but what about ourselves? Cheerfully giving ourselves to the cause of God to be used. And like I keep mentioning, you keep, you're probably tired of hearing me on this subject because you've been hearing it every time I've been up here so far this year in Canada. We need more what? Well, we need more? You hear it by now? <laughs> we need more workers, okay? You keep hearing it. I'm not going to stop, okay? Because we need cheerfully, we need people to cheerfully give their life to the cause of God. Right here in Canada because there's a lot of work to be done. If men would lay the earthly treasure upon the altar of God and would work as zealously to secure the heavenly treasure as they did to gain the earthly, they would invest means cheerfully and gladly wherever they could see an opportunity to do good and aid the cause of their master. If we could only understand what God has for us, if we could under only see the eternal world, what a blessing we would experience ourselves. You know, I remember a story of this guy. He was a, um, one of the supervisors for a, a, a major general contractor. And um, this guy was supposed to retire. And when the retirement day came, the owner of the company told the supervisor, look, I really need your help to build one more house. I really need your help. One more house I need you to build. The guy says, I plan to retire now, you know. I've had enough. I've worked so many years. He says, one more house. Just please, I really need your help. And it was a really nice house. It was a really fancy house, you know. So the guy gave him this job to do. And uh, it was practically a mansion that needed to be built. And this guy, this supervisor, was so upset. You know, here is I'm supposed to be retiring and one more house to build this, this fancy house for this stupid, wealthy person, you know, somewhere. So he went out there and he started building this house and he said, look, I, I, I've had enough of this. Worked enough all my years. And he put in the cheapest material he could have in that house. He put everything cheap in there as fast as he could done. He took every shortcut that he could imagine and finally said, here's your stupid house and I'm done and I'm retired. Here's the key to the house and you can have it. Anyway, they decide to have a retirement party for the guy. And the builder, the owner, 
uh, said, you know what, during the retirement, I have a gift for you. He says, oh, what is that? He says, I have the key to this house you just built. <laughs> Question is, what are we doing for eternity? Are we building that for eternity? Are you building or are you putting in the best material you can possibly get? Because in reality, all of this is actually our future. You're investing in your own future. It is not investing in somebody else's. It's not for someone else. It's actually for you and me. If we can understand this privilege that we have, have then we will have a whole different view on everything around us. You know, Jesus said to him what? To have eternal life, what should you do? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know, this is what God is looking for us all. To love God supremely. That's what it means. And as we're looking in our life, you know, as you're looking at the future, to love God supremely means putting everything on the altar. Putting your altar, putting your dreams, putting your goals in life on the altar. And God will actually bless you more than you can imagine. And the second commandment is to do what? Is similar to that which is what? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. Is the neighbor that we have really so close to us that we want to sacrifice whatever is necessary to save their souls? Now is the time to use means for God. Right now, we need the means. Soon, the means are going to be useless. Now is the time to be rich in good works, laying up in store for ourselves a good foundation against the time to come that we may lay hold on eternal life. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is of more value than all earthly riches. And you know, for some of you, especially some of you young people, uh, as you're looking at the future, even right, th those of you who are right now having good jobs and successful jobs right now, you know, if you will just have one taste, if you work and you see one soul saved, I can guarantee you none of the other will be in comparison. When you see one soul to turn their heart to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, all other things will lose their value. And you'd be prepared to give up everything that you have built up so far and be willing to be missionaries for Him. May the Lord help us that we may understand the value of not just if I were a millionaire, because we are. We are millionaires. God has given us means to use uh, for His cause and that we may donate not just our means, but donate ourselves for His kingdom. This is my prayer. Amen.